Hi, I'm Dr. Fiona Webster, and I'm an associate professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And I'm very excited to be talking with you today about ethnography. I received training in sociology as an ethnographer, both at the master's and the PhD levels. So I've spent my entire career immersed in healthcare settings. And as we're going to find out, immersion is one of the key concepts in ethno ethnographic research. So what is ethnography? Ethnography actually arises from anthropology, and it was used several hundred years ago to study so-called other cultures with the aim of demonstrating the superiority and universality of Western values. And of course, we've come a long way since then, and the type of ethnographies that are practiced in contemporary times uh, are no longer um, set out with that type of aim. We also no longer have this naive notion of going and seeing that used to animate early ethnographies. And we know that people's theoretical, epistemological, and ontological assumptions really inform what they pay attention to in any given setting. So ethnography, in a sort of nutshell, is the study of behavior at the group level in the context in which it occurs. And that's why immersion is so uh, important. So as ethnographers, what we do is we go and immerse ourselves uh, over a series of uh, extended periods of time in another setting. Um, so this involves, that is called field research or participant observation. And it brings up the notion of insider outsider. So you join the group as an outsider because you're doing research, but you're also an insider as well in insofar as you're spending time with that particular group. In addition to sort of the formal interviewing that we see with other forms of qualitative research, ethnography also makes use of ad hoc or informal conversations with people in the setting. Things like, oh, it looked to me that I saw some tension there between the surgeon and the nurse in the operating room. Can you tell me what your take was on that? So we're sort of always negotiating data and checking in with participants through that type of informal uh, um, conversation. And of course, also there are our observations. Really the goal, uh, having said all of this, is to understand what actually happens in any particular social environment. And of course, there's no one way to do ethnography. Uh, there's many different types of ethnography defined either by their theoretical underpinnings. So I'm thinking of approaches like critical, feminist, realist approaches to ethnography, or defined by their methods, digital ethnography, uh, indigenous autoethnography, and also not defined by its methods by, but by its analytic approach, something like institutional ethnography or IE, and that's where my training lies. So just a few words to say about theory and ethnography. Uh, as in all critical qualitative approaches, we want to be sort of paying attention to our own theoretical assumptions as we enter the field. I have a wonderful quote I'd love to share with you from a feminist uh, anthropologist, uh, Renee Fox, who said, aspiring to enter the field devoid of any preconceived notions of what one may be looking for or expect to find in order to fulfill a purest conception of scientific objectivity and impartiality is neither warranted or realistic. If it were possible to go into the field as a tabula rasa with the aim of letting the field speak, it is likely one would exit the field in the same state. So why use ethnography? Uh, when does it come into play as being a very powerful tool? So, People can't always put into words aspects of their experiences, especially those they take for granted. So when you ask people to describe things as in uh, a standard formal interview, there will always be things that they leave out that in fact may be analytically important. And this is not because they're trying to deceive you, but simply because it didn't occur to them to mention something. So for example, we did one study, we did a series of extended observations in an emergency department. And we start, started hearing clinicians use the word failure to cope. And our ears perked up as social scientists. For us, this was a very interesting phrase. We wanted to know what happened when that phrase was used. Why was that phrase being used? What did it mean? But when we first raised it to our clinical team, they said, oh, that phrase, that doesn't mean anything. 
uh, but it actually became the cornerstone of, uh, of our analysis for that work. There's also debate around how much direct access people can actually have to their own consciousness. Um, and there's things you can only learn about the culture of a group by immersing yourself in that setting. So ethnography, in a formal sense, through prolonged exposure to the field and the actors in the field, builds relationships and helps contextualize what people might tell you uh, in an interview. And beyond what people say they do, you can actually see them do it. It's iterative, and it helps you refine your situated understanding of any given phenomenon. So how do we carry out an ethnographic study? So it's probably very clear to you that we immerse ourselves in a field, we talk to people, we take detailed field notes. So um, these field notes help us to keep track of our ongoing and developing understanding and analysis uh, of what we're seeing. Um, we may, or we will likely, we will be definitely focusing on discourse and ideology. We may analyze texts in addition to our observations. And we're just always looking for the social meanings that people are assigning to either their work or their lives. We proceed with guiding questions, of course. I remember the first time I did an ethnographic observation, I went into uh, a setting. It was a social services setting, and I did not know what to look at. I didn't know what to keep track of. So, of course, we have guiding questions to help the ethnographer know what to look for and what to record. So some guiding questions in really broad strokes are things like, how do members of a particular group perceive of or understand a certain social or cultural phenomenon? So, for example, that was the guiding question um, that led a study by Dr. Ayala Cooper and her team here in Toronto looking at mor morbidity and mortality rounds. Another guiding question might be, how is a certain culture or social practice socially constructed among members of a certain group? Or, what are the factors that impact a certain type of behavior? Now, field notes are your accounts uh, describing your experiences and your observations. You should be in your field notes paying special attention to indigenous meanings that people within the setting are assigning, as well as your analysis and interpretation of those meanings. So they become the very essential grounding for writing your eventual broader and more coherent account. They should be very detailed. Detail the social and interactional processes of people's everyday lives and activities. And when I say detailed, this is what I mean. Um, I had a student go into a clinical setting, and in her field notes she said, uh, so-and-so walked in the room, he was a senior doctor. And I wrote at the margin of her field notes, I need to know, how did you know he was a senior doctor? Did he look? like a senior doctor to you, and if so, why? And, or did he introduce himself that way? So we need to really know the detail uh, that helps us later unpack why you think you're seeing what you're seeing in some instances. Now, I alluded to at the beginning that I was trained in a type of ethnography known as institutional ethnography. So I actually trained with Dorothy Smith. Uh, here at the University of Toronto uh, at OISE, and Dorothy developed an approach to sociology known as institutional ethnography, or IE for short. And IE is a study of the social organization of everyday life, and it uses people's everyday experiences as a starting point for the often invisible social relations that are underpinning their experiences. So for a, an IE researcher, the initial interviews and observations are a starting point rather than an end point of the inquiry. And it allows us to really examine the complex social relations that organize people's experiences of their everyday working lives. There's three core fundamentals of IE research that I want to share with you because no matter what type of qualitative work I, I do, these three concepts are, tend to be informing the way that I think. So first of all, standpoint. So uh, Smith is insistent that we are always starting from a particular standpoint within an institution. So this is different from starting within someone's individual perspective. This notion of standpoint is grounded in Marx's historical materialism and an insistence that we're talking about a world that actually happens. 
the everyday world. A major focus of IE research has been people's everyday lives as sites of interface between them and a vast network of institutional relations, discourses, and work processes. This interface is IE's main object of interest. IE also emphasizes the work that people do and how it's coordinated with the work of others in different settings. Work is also one of the core concepts that I learned from Smith. Um, and her concept of work is quite generous and it refers not to paid formal work, but to what people actually do in particular places under definite conditions and with definite resources. And this concept helped me with my PhD dissertation in which, in which I was looking at what clinicians who were dealing with acute stroke did in terms of best practices uh, as clinicians. And that very generous uh, definition of work let me get beyond what was stated in guidelines that clinicians should be doing to what clinicians actually were able to do. Now there's ongoing debates in ethnography and you should be aware of them. Um, and the main one that I'll share with you today is around whose values should guide observations, the ethnographer or the people being observed. And from this debate arises the very important notion of the self in ethnography. So the self in ethnography is not something that we want to sort of try and get away from or avoid. It doesn't contaminate your research. In fact, we need to identify ourselves and our standpoints and bring ourselves into the research. Um, the, the notion of values uh, also leads to questions, though, around authorial voice. Again, how best can we, can we, uh, represent other people's voices in our research. Ethnography has actually had a very rich tradition in healthcare research, and I just want to share some ethnographies that I've really enjoyed, and you may as well. Uh, uh, Howard Becker and others back in 1961, for instance, did an ethnographic study of the culture of medical school. Uh, at the time that they did this, of course, only men, or mainly men, were admitted to uh, medical school. So hence the title, Boys in White, Student Culture in Medical School. But it's still a really, uh, I think, a superb ethnography. David Rosenhan uh, did an important ethnography of psychiatric uh, practices in the 1970s called On Being Sane in Insane Places. Uh, Bruno Latour and Steve Wolgar wrote uh, a very fascinating ethnography of how science gets done, how bench science gets done, and their book is called Laboratory Life, The Construction of Scientific Facts. Paul Farmer in 1992 wrote AIDS and Accusation, Haiti and the Geography of Blame. Anne Fadiman, although not um, technically an ethnographer, wrote what I think is a profound example of ethnography called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. Um, really worth reading that. It's an examination of what happens um, when Western medical practice runs up against um, other cultural practices that people might uh, practice in their own lives. And then, of course, Bosk's very famous Forgive and Remember, Managing uh, Medical Failure, which gave rise to the patient safety movement. And finally, an excellent book by Janet Rankin and Marie Campbell uh, that uses institutional ethnography uh, to explore nursing work, and it's called Managing to Nurse Inside Canada's Healthcare Reform. So those are some of the ethnographic classics that have been really invaluable to me in my research career, and I hope you'll check them out. There are also many others uh, for you to read. Um, I'm Dr. Fiona Webster, and it's been a pleasure chatting with you today about ethnography. Mm -hmm.